any other weekend on Book TV, call 1-877-ON-C-SPAN for pricing information or to request a tape. Middle East correspondent Geneve Abdo is the author of this book, No God But God. In her book, she describes the peaceful movement on the part of moderate Islamists to transform Egypt into an Islamist state. Ms. Abdo recently talked with Book TV's Robin Scullin about this movement and what it means to the United States and to other Muslim nations. It's 40 minutes. You're looking at the cover of a new book, No God But God, Egypt and the Triumph of Islam, published by Oxford University, University Press. The author, Geneve Abdo, is here. Why did you write this book? I wrote this book because I spent some years studying um, about modern Islamic movements in the United States. And I wanted for many years to work as a journalist in the Middle East. When I finally went to the Middle East as a journalist, I found that a lot of these generalizations made in the classroom as well as in the media about contemporary Islamic movements were really misleading, a lot of the assumptions made. And so, particularly when I went to Egypt, I noticed this. Um, and so I decided to try to make a contribution to correct the record. Give us an example of the generalizations that you found. Well, one generalization that's often made is that um, Islamic movements are militant and they're violent. And when I went to Egypt, it was so obvious that the society, mass society, was religious. They prayed in mosques, they had all sorts of religious activities in their communities, and these were ordinary people. They were not militants. And in fact, at the time that I arrived in Cairo uh, in 1993, militant groups were in a very strong uh, clash with the government. They were um, violent clashes in Upper Egypt in towns such as Asyut and Minya. And the press, Western press, was focusing nearly exclusively on this development. People were fearing that perhaps President Mubarak might be out of power. Um, they were even comparing Egypt to Algeria. But what I noticed in mass society on the street was something very different, which was that nor normal Egyptians were very um, angry about the militants and, and sort of disgusted by this movement that they felt gave Islam a bad name. So your book fo focuses exclusively on Egypt? Yes, it focuses on Egypt, and the last chapter is a comparison between Egypt and Iran, where I now live. How long were you in Egypt? I was in Egypt about five years. And what was it like being a journalist and a writer there? It was very interesting. Egypt has always had a lot of inter interaction with the West, of course. Um, many historians, American historians, political scientists, archaeologists have always done research there. So it's a very um, hospitable environment for any foreigner to do research there. And. Um, in that sense, it, people were very cooperative. I mean, the, the, the subjects of my book don't generally ever meet foreigners. So it was very difficult for me to gain their trust. But in the general academic community in Egypt, people were very cooperative because they're accustomed to foreigners doing research. Did you have a book contract when you went over there? No, I went over there as a, as a correspondent, and I didn't really intend to write a book. I went there because I began a job there. I was based in Cairo, and I covered the Middle East um, for the Dallas Morning News. Um, and I didn't really, so I, my intent was not to write a book, but I developed the idea shortly after I, I arrived. Tell us a little bit more about the book. How do you set up your chapters? What are they about? Um, the first chapter is about a ghetto in Cairo called Mbaba. It's a district, a very large district of approximately one million people. And um, the reason I chose this district um, to study, and I went there over several months and years, was that I thought it was a good example um, to use to contradict a lot of the myths that we associate with Islamic movements in the United States. For example, because this is a ghetto and people are poor, er someone might assume that Egyptians in Mbaba are religious because they're unemployed, or they go to the mosque to pray because they have nothing better to do, that there was some sort of religious revival there because of people's impoverished conditions. But in fact, from my study and analysis there, it was very obvious that 
there was not really a relationship between the poverty that people were experiencing and their Islamic revivalism. And um, the other reason I chose this district is that it had been home, the, the base for all these militant groups in the 1990s. And um, in 1992, the government, in fact, sent in 14,000 troops to clear out the militants from this district because one of the militant leaders had declared um, to the New York Times in a front page story that Mbaba was a state within a state and that the Egyptian government no longer controlled this district, that the militants controlled it. So in order to regain credibility, the government sent in 14,000 troops to clear out the militants. So for all these reasons, I chose it as a sort of an example of what was happening in the country. From there, your book goes on to look at three groups, professionals, students, and women. Talk about the first group, professionals. I chose to write a chapter, it's probably the, the lengthiest chapter in the book, about um, professional unions because in the 1980s and the 1990s these unions uh, became very large. They, they represented millions of members, um, particularly the lawyers, the, the engineers and the doctors unions, or as in Egypt it's called syndicates. The uh, moderate Islamists, not the militants, who are the subject of my book, they decided to concentrate their movement within these unions. And they, historically, the unions were always controlled, the boards were, by um, activists who were supported by the state. But the Islamists decided that they were going to run candidates in union elections and try to win a majority of seats to these boards. And they did in the doctors, the engineers, uh, engineering syndicates, they won a majority of seats. And what they did, which was very significant, is I think they gave the outside world a good example of what they would do if they ever came to power in Egypt. They had very democratic elections in these unions, and they tried to some extent to create quasi-governments with all these millions of members they started providing social services. They provided their members with health insurance. They started extending loans to some of the members. For example, um, in Egypt, it's very expensive to buy a house. So they extended loans to their members to buy houses, to buy cars. They even um, offered loans to get married because it's very um, traditional in Islamic societies to have huge weddings. People spend enormous amounts of money far beyond their means to have weddings for their children because it's considered, of course, a very big event. So the, the Islamists, as a result of these kinds of, of services, became very, very powerful in the unions. And what happened eventually uh, up to the 19, early 1990s is that the government closed the unions they banned them because the Islamists were becoming too powerful. And today, many of these cases are pending in the courts. In some cases, uh, I think in the engineering union, for example, the court has told the state that the ban is illegal and that the union must be reopened and allowed to function. But that hasn't happened yet. Um, recently, a court um, ruled that the government should allow elections to be held in the lawyers union because elections were banned and the union was closed. Again, this has not happened yet. So now we have not only a situation where these unions were closed, but now the state is actually defying court rulings to keep the unions closed. This is the extent to which they feel threatened. A basic question. Is Egypt a democracy? No. <laughs> um, there have been there have been generally elections held in Egypt, parliamentary elections and even the presidential elections, which everyone assumes are are a fraud. Um, there is always rigging at the ballot boxes. Uh, in uh, many elections, for example, candidates are disqualified in the first round, and and people always challenge. The, the actual count of the vote. Someone who seems to be very popular somehow doesn't ever receive any votes. In addition to that, um, in recent parliamentary polls, the state has often prevented uh, candidates who are very powerful, who are Islamic oriented, from running by putting them in jail. 
Um, one of the men that I feature in the book, Assam el Idian, in 1995, he was a very, very prominent Islamic leader, a moderate. And he was already held a seat in the parliament. And he was going to run for re-election. But he was arrested in January before the poll was held that autumn, it, more or less for the purpose of, of cancelling him from the election and preventing him from running. What premise did the state give for his arrest? They charged him with um, distributing uh, illegal leaflets and for his association to the Muslim Brotherhood, which is a huge Islamic organization which has at different points in time has been legal and banned in Egypt. Um, it's, it renounced violence a long time ago, but the government shifts back and forth as to whether it decides that the Muslim Brotherhood is a terrorist organization or isn't. And at the time, um, the government felt under threat by the Muslim Brotherhood, and this was the charge. What is the Muslim, Muslim Brotherhood? It's an organization which was founded in 1928, a very large um, Islamic organization that at one time was the most structured form of an Islamic movement that existed in Egypt. But the people that I have written about, who I believe are the new leaders of Egypt, who are Islamic moderates, many of them left the Muslim Brotherhood years ago, and they don't really associate, it, associate with this movement, which is considered to be, by some, a bit passé. Um, for many years, it existed as a clandestine organization in Egypt, even though, as I mentioned recently, in recent years, it renounced violence. But the new generation that I have written about is not really associated with the Muslim Brotherhood. They, they in fact, tried to create a new party um, in Egypt that was comprised of even Christians. But this party has been banned, so it wasn't even allowed to be legalized. It wasn't legalized. So how have they been successful in, in reviving Islamic religion in Egypt? Um, the moderates not, uh, have been very successful by trying to penetrate institutions such as the syndicates. Um, they've also been very active on, in the universities. Um, the, there was an Islamist paper which was published for many years in Egypt called El Shab, and it was very much associated with the Labour Party, which was another party, Islamic Party, or Islamic oriented party, we should say, which was banned. Together, El Shab and the later Labour Party, for example, would organize students in the campuses and on university ca in university clubs, in Islamic organizations, in universities. They, for example, would hold monthly sessions for students at either the newspaper office or the party office. And through this kind of grassroots movement, this is how the Islamic moderates became powerful. Um, so we have power being taken over in the syndicates, we have organizations in the universities, and also even within uh, government institutions, there's a large Islamic institution in Cairo called El Azhar, which is where sheikhs study about Sunni Islam. And in this institution, the uh, sheikhs also began to side with the moderates in terms of the decrees that they issued on social policies. And um, so the Islamists were able to even penetrate an institution like El Azhar, which historically, for many centuries, has been supportive of state policy. Is a sheikh a priest? In a sense. Um, a sheikh is a preacher. He gives sermons in the mosques on Fridays, for example. Um, he counsels ordinary people at, at this institution that I'm talking about, El Azhar. You can go there any day as an ordinary Egyptian, and they have something called a fatwa committee. Fatwa meaning a religious ruling or edict. And you can go there, for example, if you want to ask if you can divorce your husband. Is it um, legal in Islam? You could ask the sheikh. My husband has done this to me, or he's... He, he's treated me this way. Do I have a legal right under law to, to divorce him? Um, people often ask about property rights. Um, if they can um, buy a piece of property or they have all sorts of questions that are related to religion. And this is the function of the institution. So does the sheikh work parallel to a court where the same decisions are questioned in a court of law? 
or is it just a religious decision? It's a religious decision that it, that is not necessarily uh, valid in a court of law. But what we have seen in recent years is that the opinions issued by Al Azhar have an, an influence on the courts indirectly because if a sheikh for example issues an opinion that a professor at Cairo University is an apostate because he published a book that blasphemes Islam and this has happened in many cases in Egypt of course it's up to the court to decide if the man in fact uh, committed this crime but there's great influence uh, now uh, from the sheikhs to influence even the courts. You mentioned a particular, I'm going to use the word censor censorship issue, I don't know if that's appropriate, but help me with the pronunciation, Hamid Abdu Zayed? Zayed. Zayed. Hamid Ab Abu Zayed. What happened with that case mm -hmm. of, uh, of his and how does it compare to, let's say, Salman Rushdie? Rushdie? There were many similarities and just a few moments ago when I was speaking generally about professors say being questioned about their writings this is exactly what happened to this man uh, Nasser Abu Zaid he was a professor in the mid 1990s at Cairo University and um, he uh, was his writings were analyzed by a committee of professors within his department and the ruling of the committee of the professor of this committee was that he had that his writings violated Islamic principles. One professor then took this decision even further and filed a suit against Professor Abu Zaid in the courts under a very obscure statute, um, which according to Islamic law means that if you can prove someone has has violated their Islamic principles and they're an apostate then they can no longer be married to a Muslim woman so it's a very it's a very complicated statute but what some of the professors at the university did is under this statute which is called Hizba they argued that Professor Abu Zayed could no longer be married to his wife because according to his writings he had blasphemed Islam and therefore he must be divorced from his wife. Well this created a huge scandal of course and it was such an unusual case. And it was in the courts for many months and basically the court sided with the Islamists and said that he had to be divorced from his wife um, according to this statute. Um, and I think the case was on appeal but in the end, the professor fled to the Netherlands with his wife, <laughs> and that's how it ended. Do you think the Western press and Westerners can understand um, how in Egypt the religion and the laws come together and, and don't remain separate as America claims to keep them separate? Do you think that's a hard concept for Western press and Western people to understand? Yes, it's very difficult for any Westerner to understand that there is no separation between state and the state and, and, and religion in Islam. This concept is extremely difficult for us to understand. And I think that it is perhaps the greatest obstacle to understanding Islamic countries. Uh, because, of course, we don't understand how a cleric can have some influence on what's decided in a court of law. And in most Muslim countries, even the countries themselves are are struggling to try to reconcile these two concepts. In Egypt, for example, the court, m much of the court system or the laws, they, they are very old and they even were written during periods of colonialization, of the colonialization of Egypt when Egypt was colonized by the British, for example. And so even within the court system, the Egyptians have not sorted out this relationship between what we know to be civil law and Islamic law. And um, even today, this is a big struggle within Egypt. So does that help the state or does that help the Islamist movement? Yes. Or does it hurt both and make the tensions increase? It helps and hurts at different times. In this case, of course, by using this obscure statute, the Islamists won.
Um, in other cases, the government can sort of manipulate the judicial process in its favor. So it sort of depends on the type of case that's being brought before a court. Now, to go back to your different chapters, you've talked about the professionals and the syndicates and a little bit about the universities. What about the role of women? How has that been impacted by this movement, this increase in religion? Women have been very influenced by this Islamic revival. They have not led the way. They're not the leaders in the movement, but they've been extremely influenced in many ways, um, just superficially. Uh, a vast majority of women in Egypt wear headscarf. They're veiled, even though veiling is not mandatory. Um, even schoolgirls now are veiled. Uh, I, if you travel across the country and you, you're out on the street at two or three in the afternoon, when all the school children run out of school buildings, you can see that every young girl is wearing a headscarf. It's is part of totally the school new? uniform. No, it's not new. It's been emerging over several years. But now it's, um, it's so noticeable, it's much more noticeable than it was, say, 20 years ago, um, because so many schoolgirls are veiling. It's part of the school uniform. Um, women have also been very influenced by some of the sheikhs that have emerged on television on, in religious programming, which has existed since the 1980s. And also, um, they have even themselves taken a lot of steps to uh, create activities such as they organize Quranic reading sessions in their homes. And I visited many of the homes where these um, Quran readings were taking place. Did you wear a veil? No, they didn't require me to wear a veil. Some, but many of the women did wear a veil. But they said, well, you're a foreigner and you're a Christian, you're not even a Muslim, so you don't have to wear a veil. Um, and so, and they, um, some of the activities that I'm describing, these Quranic sessions, they emerged after one sheikh, um, whose name was Omar Abdul Kafi, became very popular in Egypt in the 80s and 90s. And he, he was considered the women's sheikh because he preached a lot about women's issues. And in Cairo, many women began following him. Why do you think um, in the age of mo modern technology and advancement of women in many parts of the world that some women in Egypt are returning to more traditional modes of dress and to the religion? I think that um, this is another misunderstanding which takes place between East and West. The kinds of changes that Egyptian women have made in their lives, they consider to be a form of liberation. Whereas we in the West might consider their, these developments to be backward. Um, I mean, the, the, the average Western feminist would not probably not agree that wearing a veil is a form of liberation. But a lot of women feel that by, for example, wearing a veil or becoming less feminine on the street, that this gives them a certain anonymity that protects them from harassment by men or from being a sexual object, not even harassment, but being a sexual object. Uh, uh, many women, a majority probably, wear headscarves in, their, in the workplace. If you go to a government office in Egypt, women are wearing veils. And again, they consider this to be a help rather than a hindrance in their relationship with men. Um, women over the last 20 years have also joined the workforce in much far greater numbers than they did in the past. They now, um, there uh, are far many more women who have a higher degree who attend universities than say they did in the 20 or 30 years ago. So in many ways there has been a lot of progress um, in terms of education, in terms of women working. Women are doctors, lawyers, uh, they, they have various professions, engineers. So there's been progress on that front. So I think that we have to be cautious not to use our own Western standards to say that because a woman wears a veil, that means that she's backward and that's not her preference. When you talked about the, the veiling, you mentioned certain actresses and celebrities that moved away from not wearing a veil to wearing a veil. Why, why did you study them? What did that show? I used actresses as an example of this phenomenon, this Islamization of society, because they would be considered the last people to become part of this movement.
first of all, actress in Egypt, actresses are like goddesses. Um, Cairo is sort of the Hollywood of the Arab film world. And actresses in Egypt, people adore them. They refer to them by their first name. They're, they're plastered on billboards all over the city. And they're symbols of secularism. The actresses are very glamorous. They have very uh, um, luxurious lives. They travel abroad. They wear designer clothes. They have all the advantages that a majority of Egyptians don't have. So when these women began veiling, they shattered most generalizations you can make about why people are becoming more Islamic. They were wealthy, so they weren't impoverished. They weren't turning to religion because they were desperate. They had very uh, glamorous careers. They had money. And they were superstars in the country. So I use this example in a way to try to shatter some of the mythology that's been created about the reasons for Islamic revivalism. Is there a difference between a veil and a shadower? Yes. What is a shadower? Um, well, a veil is generally the term that's used for a, a covering. But there are different types of veils depending upon which Islamic country you're talking about. The chador is the traditional dress in Iran, which has existed for many, many years. Even, I mean, long before, of course, the 1979 Islamic Revolution. And it's a generally black. I mean, it's always black. And it's a, it's a covering that extends from your head to, to your feet. And often it has different layers. Some women in Iran, it's, it's what worn in Iran. Most women in Iran have an inner covering. And then the, the actual outer covering is sort of like a cape and they wear it loosely over their head and it extends to the ground. The, the purpose of this is to disguise any shape so that you can't notice the outlines of a woman's body as she's walking or Why or would they want the to disguise the shape? Because this is considered uh, um, seductive. Um, I mean, the whole purpose of veiling a woman is so she doesn't become a sexual object. Um, some feminists who have written extensively about this subject, or historians, make the argument that this says much more about men in Islamic societies than it does about women, because all of this is based on the assumption that w men cannot control their sexual urges, therefore women should be covered up. And so from a feminist argument, West or East, many people say that this is why veiling should be banned. Is that the same argument with the female circumcision, which you talk about in the book? Is it the same idea that it's to prevent men from being with women in a sexual way? Yes. Um, the, the rationale behind that argument is twofold. What you just mentioned, which is that men are too weak to resist women. But the other is that women have so many sexual urges that in order to control the sexual appetite, they should be circumcised. You talked about the way a CNN uh, report covered the female circumcision issue. Elaborate or tell the viewers what happened there. Um, during the 1994 UN Population Conference in Cairo, CNN showed uh, a circumcision on television being performed. It was a circumcision that was performed in Cairo. They showed this on television. and. Um, it was, as you can imagine, quite shocking and uh, because of the, the procedure itself. And um, it created a huge controversy. I mean, not only in the West, of course, because most people consider this practice to be inhumane, but also in Egypt because it drew attention to the fact that this practice is so pervasive in Egyptian society. Um, the st statistics are quite high, something like 95 to 97 percent of Egyptian girls are circumcised in varying degrees, some more severe than others. But it drew attention to this fact of life, which is that girls in Egypt are circumcised. And it was a huge embarrassment for the government because the Western world views this as a, a sort of barbaric practice. Did you, did you yourself think that CNN was right or wrong in showing that on television? I myself thought it was wrong um, because it didn't really serve any useful or constructive purpose.
what happened as a result of this uh, showing of this program was that the government issued an official ban on circumcision. Um, society, people in society didn't obey this ban. Instead, rather than going to a doctor who would normally perform these circumcisions or a qualified person in a clinic, medical personnel in the clinic, they were afraid. So it forced women or mothers to take their children to say back alleys to have these procedures done. It had the same effect that um, that once existed in this country when abortion was banned. And rather than discourage circumcision, which is quite impossible when you have statistics such, you know, 95% of the population performing this, you know, having this procedure done on their children, rather than addressing that issue, the only thing it did was create more harm by encouraging people to do it illegally. Is this done in other Middle Eastern countries? Is this done in Saudi Arabia and other parts of the world? It's, um, it's a tradition that dates back centuries, which originated in Africa, and it's very, very widespread in the Sudan, but it's most pervasive in, in, in African countries. I also wanted to ask you about, going back to the chador, you wore one. Yes. Why? Um, I wear a chador in Iran um, at times. If I interview, as a journalist, if I interview conservative clerics or people who are traditional because <clears throat> I really f believe that it's a way to show respect for their religious principles. And as a journalist, of course, I want people to feel at ease. I want them to be able to talk to me freely. And if I offend them with my own sort of Western principles or, or Western tendencies, this is not exactly a good way to get to, to, to gain someone's confidence. Um, this is a very controversial issue, especially among Western women. Um, many Western women ask me in Iran, well, how could you possibly wear a chador? You're selling out your feminist ideas and principles. I don't really look at it that way because my objective is not to be a feminist crusader in Iran. It's to try to understand the country and the society. And in order to do that, I think that you have to uh, make compromises. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Texas. <laughs> and where, what was your family like? Um, my family, all, I'm third generation Lebanese. My family, are, they're Maronites from Beirut. Um, I grew up in, a f in what was culturally an Arab household um, to the extent that, you know, my mother made Arabic food and we often went to the Maronite church, um, at least when I was young. And there were certain traditions that in my home which are similar to any household in the Middle East. Uh, the ideas that my father had, for example, and uh, this type of thing. But for the most part, because I was third generation Lebanese, I mean, we were Americans and lived as, you know, any American might. You know. Where'd you go to school? Where'd you study? Um, I went to the University of Texas in Austin, and then I later went to Pr Princeton where I studied, began studying about Islamic movements. I wanted to ask you about the government more and some names in Egyptian politics that you bring up in your book. In particular, um, Nasser, Sadat, and Mubarak. How has their reputation and influence, how does it permeate the Islamic movement? Are they all against these leaders? Is it a tension that can't be diffused. How does that work? Um, President Sadat played a key role in what we know today to be the development of this movement um, in that he, in the 1970s when he was president, he encouraged Islamic students, the Islamic oriented students on the universities to organize. He made sure that his government funded their activities and their groups and he did this because at the time, the leftist students, students who were Marxist and more socialist oriented, were posing a, a, a challenge to his government. For example, they held demonstrations in the streets of Cairo, demonstrating against his policies. And so as a tactical move, he thought, well, if I can raise the profile of these Islamic students, they'll become powerful and then I won't have to worry about the leftists.
But his great miscalculation was that in a very short span of time, from approximately 1972 to when he was assassinated in 1981, the, the movement that he helped to develop in the campuses became so powerful and it became violent and militant that in 1981, the same people that he had encouraged assassinated him. I wanted to read just about that moment in 1981, uh, a sentence or two from your book about the reaction to Anwar Sadat's assassination. On page 132, you write, there were few tears shed after Khalid Islambouli fired several rounds of automatic gunfire into Sadat's body as he attended a military parade on October 6, 1981. The young officer had burst from a passing military truck while his accomplices laid down a barrage of covering fire and tossed hand grenades. The Western world was shocked at the loss of a loyal ally, but most Egyptians simply looked the other way. Why did they look the other way? At that time, President Sadat had become discredited by his own people for making peace with Israel. And um, in addition to this movement, which was just forming, this Islamic movement, he made peace with Israel, and this was a huge turning point in not only, of course, his relationship with the West, but with, in his relationship with his own people. And even today, Egyptians are very much against the peace process. At the time, it made him hugely unpopular. Why are they against the peace process? They believe that um, the Oslo Agreement favors Israel and takes away land rightfully belonging to the Palestinians. And they believe that what has happened over time for half a century is that the Palestinians' right to land that they were forced to flee by the establishment of the State of Israel has diminished to such an extent that by the time Oslo was written, what they were actually negotiating was a very small percentage of what they could have gained, say, in 1948 after the, the foundation of Israel formation of Israel, if they had begun negotiating then. They even blame Yasser Arafat, their own leader, for making too many concessions to the, the amount of land that the Palestinians should receive under Oslo. And the Egyptians, because they've been thrown in the midst of this process, of course there's always been a domestic reaction. How about Mubarak? How does he stand today in his own country? How is he regarded? He's regarded, Egyptians are very nationalistic. And when their president, for example, is criticized by the West, of course they will take the side of President Mubarak and um, support him. However, politically, he's, his powers have been seriously undermined by this religious movement that I've written about. Because in opposition, they have over time limited his powers by creating their own power centers within the institutions, you know, that we talked about earlier. Have you ever met him or interviewed him? No, I've attended a lot of his press conferences, but um, I've never interviewed him. Requests that I had made to interview, him, in, to interview him were denied. What's been the reaction to this book so far from, you know, Western reviewers? Um, so far, it's received a positive review. Um, reviews, and I think that the statement that has been made so far, it just came out last week, um, that I think is, is, is comforting, um, the statement that's been made is that this offers a new, a fresh new look at Islam as a religion, as a political movement, and that it takes, it has a completely different voice. It has added a new voice to the debate, which is that Muslims aren't violent, that Islam is a religion, it, that it doesn't seek violence or upheaval. And this is, was really my point in, in writing this book. Would Oxford University Press be allowed to publish this book in Egypt? I, I know that it will probably be translated into Arabic. Um, generally, Western presses aren't allowed to publish, say, in Egypt. It would have to be an Egyptian press which would buy the rights to publish it. Um, I don't know if the book will be published in Egypt, but I, it's probably doubtful. 
Also, one last question. When you talked about doing these interviews for your book, did you ever feel like you were in danger? Were you ever afraid when you were getting, you know, your interviews for the research? No, I was never afraid because the people that I spent many months with are, are moderate Islamists, as I define them, and they're not, I never felt threatened. I mean, had I written a book about the militant movement, perhaps I would have felt threatened, but not among the people that I interviewed. Well, Geneve Abdu, Abdo, excuse me, thanks for coming in to tell us about your book, you. No God But God, Egypt and the Triumph of Islam, published by Oxford University Press. Geneve Abdo has reported from numerous Islamic countries over the past 10 years. She's currently the correspondent in Iran for The Guardian and The Economist. Her book, No God But God, Egypt and the Triumph of Islam, is published by Oxford University Press.